Good evening. On behalf of the Fielding Board of Trustees, I'd like to thank you for joining Fielding Graduate University this evening for the women in leadership, motivation, experiences, and reflections event here at the beautiful Marjorie Luke, Luke Theater. You're in for a real treat. As part of our year-long 40th anniversary celebration, we are honored to be hosting this discussion addressing gender empowerment and female leadership with such an accomplished panel of women, leaders impacting change in government, education, health, environment, and media. Fielding has a long legacy of cultivating leaders for a changing world and was founded on the premise that education is ultimately about action for social change. Through transformational learning, deep understanding, interdisciplinary scholarship, and direct application, Fielding prepares individuals to face social justice challenges with intelligent and passionate engagement. Over the past 40 years, over 800 Fielding scholars have conducted in-depth doctoral dissertation research specifically on the issue of gender in relation to education, leadership, psychology, media, and organizational development. From this rich tradition and a student body comprised of 70% women in the Worldwide Network of Gender Empowerment, or WNGE, was born. For the past decade, WNGE has been working on critical issues around the globe and is recognized and registered non-governmental organization with the United Nations. As an international NGO representing global partners, WNGE contributes to issues of critical concern to the global development agenda with a focus on impacting change in sectors including education, health care, environment, violence prevention, equality, and globalization. As you can see from the opening video, progress has been made around women's rights, empowerment, and gender equality. But we have much work ahead of us, both internationally and domestically. According to the latest Global Gender Gap Report, an annual index which measures the relative gaps between women and men across 136 countries and across four key areas, health, education, economics, and politics, the United States, get this, the United States is ranked at 23, falling below a list of wealthy nations, but also countries such as Nicaragua, Burundi, Philippines, Lesotho, Bolivia, South Africa, and Cuba. The sobering fact is that despite being half the Earth's population, not one country on this Earth has achieved gender parity. So there is still much work ahead of us. This evening, however, we're shifting perspective from the external arena to delve into the internal dynamics of accomplished women leaders who have been impacting change throughout their careers. The discussion will explore work and career choices, leadership characteristics, and challenges faced and overcome. The conversation tonight aims to provide insight into the ongoing creative process of work-life balance and share the wisdom learned from decades of hard work, tempered by introspection and discovery as a special surprise in commemoration of April as Poetry Month, we have Santa Barbara, we have Santa Barbara former poet laureate providing a powerful reading at the close of the event. 
Of course, none of this is possible without the generous support of our donors and sponsors. For this event, we would like to thank our sponsors, Montecito Bank and Trust, Cox Communications, the Fund for Santa Barbara, and the Marjorie Luke Theaters Dryer Family Subsidy Fund for their support and contributions. Before I introduce our next esteemed person, I want to recognize a few of our elected officials in the audience. My colleague on the Board of Supervisors, Second District Supervisor, Janet Wolf. She's back there. Lompoc City Council Member, Ashley Costa. Representing Assembly Member Doss Williams, Jeanette Sanchez. Representing Santa Barbara County 3rd District Supervisor, Doreen Farr's office, Esther Aguilera. To lead this discussion, we have a woman who has been a part of the fielding community for over 30 years and has served in several senior executive capacities, including Provost, Vice President of Academic Planning and Program Development, and Dean for Human and Organizational Development. She is currently Faculty Chair for the School of Educational Leadership for Change, and is a founding member and director of the Worldwide Network for Gender Empowerment. She received her doctoral degree in education from Boston University and sits on, an, on numerous boards, including the Fund for Santa Barbara. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Anna DeStefano. It's my pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of Fielding, on behalf of WING, the Worldwide Network for Gender Empowerment. Uh, Fielding celebrates this year its 40th anniversary. And it's an opportunity for us to celebrate not only who we have been and what we have done, but also to begin a new chapter, a relaunch of WING, and in some ways of Fielding, as we move forward to con confront uh, the challenges of the 21st century for which we think we are well poised. Um, I am thrilled to welcome the three women onto the stage who you will learn more from and about tonight. So I'm gonna bring them all out together. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Peggy O'Brien. Hello, Dolly. <laughs> Secretary Kathleen Sebelius. And President Katrina Rogers. Okay, full disclosure. I went to college with two of these three women. And we're glad to see each other again. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the format uh, for tonight's conversation. And we really do see it as a conversation. Um, some questions have been prepared, but we have no idea where the conversation will go. Um, so uh, buckle your seatbelts. Um, um, I will pose a question either to all of us or to one of us and then the rest of us will join in with questions, comments, observations, stories, uh, whatever we think appropriate, okay? So um, I'll begin by asking a question for everyone, which um, in a sense builds on the video and the song, which you all have uh, just heard. So, and um, I will ask, Peggy, to start, but you're each going to go. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> um, how has working internationally affected you as a leader and as a person? Uh, so I would say very quickly 
that I have not done a huge amount of work directly internationally, but I have an international experience that has affected me hugely, and that is my that is within my own family, um, and and work and life all weaves together. So I am I am an Irish Catholic from Boston, which you might be able to tell at least the Irish Catholic part <laughs> by looking at my face, um, and I am the mother of two children, who are all grown up, and my son, who also has a face that looks like mine. Um, fell madly in love with a wonderful woman whose name is Saba Brelvi, and he, she is Indian and Muslim, and he converted to Islam. And I have three grandchildren whose names are Hamza Abdullah O'Brien, and Shazia <laughs> Sultana O'Brien, and Nyla Sultana O'Brien. I can show you pictures afterwards. <laughs> but what, and, when, and we are a pretty savvy family, but it, it, was a, it has been, continues to be, a fabulous educational um, road for our family and also for Sabah's family. And so we have, we have learned a ton of things. It has led to actually international work. Um, but it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing process that, that expands your perspectives exponentially and makes, you, makes me realize that the world that my grandchildren are growing up in is the world that I want them to grow up in, and in a sense, the world that I wish I had grown up in. Thank you. That's me. Yeah, Kathleen. My son married a Boston girl. Oh. So, so um, we don't have that family experience. But I guess I've, I've had two uh, different international work experiences. Uh, one, when I was governor, we did trade missions. And in that capacity, we were really bringing CEOs of various Kansas companies and farms to figure out how to do business overseas, and that in and of itself was fascinating. What I found out in lots of countries is that a government official can open doors that often private sector can't, particularly in, like China, you really couldn't get very far unless you had a government official yeah. with you. Um, so that was a fascinating experience. In, in this current capacity, uh, HHS has a huge footprint. We have um, employees in 80 countries. And um, one of the things that I've, I've learned a lot about is health is really, um, some people call it soft diplomacy, I would call it smart diplomacy. <laughs> because while people internationally may not like our State Department, they don't necessarily like our trade laws, they certainly don't like our Defense Department, um, they have lots of problems sometimes with uh, some of the international issues everybody is eager to share research information. They want to um, have our expertise in helping to train doctors and nurses to know what we know about infant mortality and how to save lives. Uh, Peggy was reminding me earlier, um, I was able to be in, in India when they were celebrating one year polio free, which just occurred two years ago because they'd done a massive campaign to vaccinate mm -hmm. uh, 100 million children in India. So it's been a fascinating way to not only see the world and to get to know people, but in the capacity of winning hearts and minds, health is a great lead. Um, and also you find out, regardless of whether it's the poorest village in um, India or uh, some very rural community in Africa, how much in common people have mm -hmm. and how much those parents want exactly the same things that somebody growing up in Boston wants for their kids, how eager they are to exchange ideas and issues, and how important women are in each of those places. Women are the caregivers, they're the health givers. Um, if you provide health to women, they save their children and they save the communities. If if they have some economic empowerment, they empower the community. So health leaders and international leaders have figured out if they invest in women, they often invest in their entire country. So it's been kind of a, I wish we'd learned that more here in this country. It's uh -huh. something we should import. Uh -huh. We will. We yeah. Will. Katrina. Thank you. Just making sure that this works. I yes. think it does Thank now. I think my, my experience has been a little bit different. So I actually worked internationally for many years. And, and, and I think that I took a lot from that work back into my leadership. So for example, I think it's hard enough to be a leader and a manager these days. And, and most of you sitting in this room also have this experience. Imagine doing that in another country in a foreign language. And what it proved to me, or what it showed to me, is that the world is not as flat 
as we've been led to believe. So if you think about Thomas Friedman's work about the world of flight, he popularized this notion that because of globalization, there's been a homogenization of culture, of goods, services, communications. And to some extent, that's really true. And yet, the first thing you'll notice when you work in another culture is how we're all driven by particular cultural norms. And that's when you realize that the world is not as flat as you think, that we still have enormous differences in the ways that we interpret everything from conversations to leadership styles to management to the ways we engage in each other to gender roles. And so I think as a woman in, a, in other cultures, in other countries, it is remarkable how quickly you come across that and how quickly it feels like a barrier. And some of you may already have that experience. So for me, what I learned is the importance of being, if you will, a little chameleonic as, as a leader and be able to hold a space of not being judgmental. And I don't mean not making decisions. I mean being very open. So struck by your comment, Kathleen, about uh, being having 80, you know, you're working in 80 countries. Well, you cannot hold your cultural norms to yourself. I mean, in other words, you have to be very savvy mm -hmm. about being cultural, interculturally competent. And I think, so there's a chameleonic nature to leadership when you're in, in working in other countries and there's a sense of difference that you are other. And furthermore though, I think it's important to hold fast to your core. Because like you said, and like you said, there are different, uh, Peggy, you mentioned it too, there are differences and yet, we're all the same, in a sense, mm -hmm. in, that, oh, in, in terms of the things we all need and want and care about. And so you hold both in your heart, I think, as you grow in your leadership. So I think international work is, is extremely um, opening as an opportunity to bring back the best ideas mm -hmm. and also to grow your own self-awareness. So it's inevitable. International work is inevitable. Yeah. No, anyway. So, no, I was just going to ask if you made up the word chameleonic. Yeah. <laughs> I may have. I, was just I hesitated. That. Kind of a cool so, word. Any English majors in there want to check out that yeah. on your smartphone? Well, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of it as sort of similar and different from some of what you have all said. My experience has been working a lot with women internationally, not necessarily with men, sometimes in China with men, um, in Saudi Arabia with women, in Mexico with both. Um, and what I found almost throughout, though, is that they're very relational. Um, all of those cultures, to me, were very relational in their approach to the work that we were doing. In one, it was at the elementary school level. In another, it was at the graduate school level. In another, it was in a community-based situation. And people really value relationships internationally in a way that often, it seems to me, Americans sort of get right to the point, you get right to the task, get right to the matter at hand. When I think most of, of the countries, at least that I've worked in, people want to get to know you, and they want yeah. to get to know you um, personally before they are willing to, quote unquote, do business with you. I think that's, that's very true. Um, really, everywhere that I can think of, they, there is a, um, and I, I think, you know, to Katrina's point, that has to be off-putting to a lot of people coming to this country. Because in this country, you could, you could spend hours in meetings and days in meetings, and nobody would ever ask you a personal question that would... Right. Um, or offer you a cup of coffee. You know, or, <laughs> right, or want to know if, if you have a way home, or, right. you know, how your mother is. Exactly. In other countries, you can spend three hours, and they're almost insulted if you talk about business before you get to Absolutely. all of those pieces of puzzle, and eat at every meal, and presents are exchanged. And, Exactly. So it's a very different. Um, I often feel that we are we are not very gracious, and we're we're certainly not, as you say, <laughs> building relationships. I mean, there's a lot of okay. You got 30 minutes. Sit down. Do your business. Get right. out. Move um, on. Move on. Yeah. Okay. So we'll move into now the more directed questions, and then remember that we can respond as we choose and think right. Um, for Katrina, what do you think of as your first meaningful job? Why did you pursue it? In what ways was it meaningful? I think we need to answer that question a little bit differently so, <laughs> than you might expect, Anna. Oh, okay. Early on, I decided that, that the, our life is about the meaning we make of it. And we derive meaning from our lives every day. And 
work is part of our life. Mm -hmm. And so for me, every job I've had has been meaningful in some way or another. And you, you know, you've probably run across people for whom their best job is either the job they just left, because they're sorry they left it, or the job they're about to get. In other words, they're not living in that present moment. And so I think it's important to ask yourself, in whatever work you're doing, what is the meaning I'm making of my work? And so for me, whether I've been a maid, whether I've been a you know, car rental agent, or running a campus in Europe, they were all meaningful because I was able to figure out the experiences in the moment that mattered. So for example, as a maid, I, a hotel maid, I, uh, I was the only woman, only white woman with Navajo women. And the Navajo women taught me a lot about matriarchal culture in our own society, and also about poverty, and about community, and about relational kinds of work. And so I think you, you make meaning wherever you are, if you're lucky mm -hmm. enough to, to be able to reflect on, on, meaning, on meaning and on work. And I'd be curious about Peggy and Kathleen, and because in, in that you all went to college together, so full disclosure, they're the three that went to college yeah. together. <laughs> I know that will surprise you. Guess you can guess that. Other and people but who went to college with dyed their hair, but some of us didn't. <laughs> Just want to say right. that. That's, that's, that's too lazy. Be. <laughs> But what you don't know is we all went to women's colleges. Right. And, and in my case, my women's college went co-ed. And I think that was a, a very important time in my life. And I may have been one of the last generation of women to be educated in women's only colleges, because there aren't many left, although mm -hmm. yours still, ours persists. still exists. Yeah. And so I think one of the things, and, and they were Catholic colleges, no less. One of the things you learn, and at least I learned in college, is the, the value you make of your life around meaning making. And I'm just kind of curious about your experiences as well. I, well, I would like to answer that or reflect on what you're saying by asking a question, because we are sitting in an auditorium in a junior high school. So who in this room is a teacher? If you are, would you put your hand up? Who in this room has been affected by a teacher? <laughs> okay, so I, that, that was, um, I'm not sure it's the first meaningful job I ever had, but I, I, it is something that I have done all, for a lot of my life. And I started to do it in, uh, in 1968. I decided that I wanted to be a teacher because I thought that the most important kind of social activism that you could practice was to help people get connected to the power of their own brains. And I thought that when I was 20, and I'm 66, and I think that every day. So there are lots and lots of meaningful jobs. I am completely biased, because I think that teaching is one of the most, most meaningful kinds of, the most meaningful of professions. Um, and that's why it's a pleasure to be at this event that is being hosted by Fielding. Thank you. Well, I would say that, um, like you, Katrina, a lot of, I think the jobs I've had, I, almost all of them have had um, some real meaning, but probably the most important for me was my first job um, because I had no idea what I wanted to do and no idea what I would do. And um, I got out of school, out of college. I traveled for a while with a good friend, and then I found myself back in Washington where we'd all gone to school and um, ended up being hired um, to do very unusual work. I was 22 years old, and uh, in Washington, after there had been very serious riots in the mid-60s, where major parts of Washington were burned to the ground after Martin Luther King was killed. And um, I ended up um, meeting a lawyer at a cocktail party who said, oh, do you have a job? Because we have a job for you. What I later found out is it was a job he would have never done in his life. And you know, so he thought it was a good job for me. It was working um, in an ex-convict organization in the heart of a burned out section of Washington. Um, and the four guys who ran this office were all out of prison. And they were helping people coming out of prison get jobs. Now, I was 22 and white and in an entirely black section of town. And the man who ran the organization went by the name of Rev. He had um, lost his voice in prison because he'd been stabbed in the throat with a knife. 
and he talked with a voice box. He was very for it. So my first day on the job, um, which was in and of itself an amazing experience, was traveling around a very burned out block in Washington. And he took me by the hand, and we went to the pawn shop next door, and then to the Greens place, and then around the block. And he would, he would come in the door, and people would stand up and kind of greet him, and, and he would say, see this girl? Don't fuck with this girl. <laughs> see her car? Don't fuck with her car. <laughs> I'd say, hello, how are you? He'd say, come on. And we'd go around, and we, we went through the whole block. And um, it, was, uh, it was an experience for me that was terrifying and also incredibly empowering. I realized after that work experience, which lasted about a year and a half, and then I went on and did other corrections work, that I could really do anything. Um, I learned an incredible amount not just um, about corrections and these guys, but about myself. It taught me a little bit of fearlessness. It, um, it, um, I figured you could be dropped in any situation, kind of figure it out. And uh, it was an amazingly meaningful uh, job on all sorts of levels. But um, that's how I began my work career <laughs> with Rev. And, um, I'd never quite had a job introduction like that before or since. I, you know, it was a once in a lifetime, but yeah. I still remember it vividly. I'd save it. I think it's a good one, yeah. <laughs> I think it's, we were talking earlier today, and I think it's interesting that, one, that you learned you could do anything. Mm -hmm. And I think that we were talking about the fact that women often think that they have to somehow be prepared, right. know how to do right. something before they're hired to do something, rather than to be right. hired to learn yeah. how to do something, and to believe in our own capacity to do that. Well, we were talking earlier about the fact that, um, you know, I think all of us have worked with incredibly talented young women, and some talented and not so talented young men. Um, <laughs> and I'm the mother of, of two wonderful sons, uh, so I'm sort of biased, but um, a key difference, I think, is that most of the guys I've worked with at various points in their lives are, you know, pick me, pick me, I'm ready, I'm ready. And so many of the incredibly talented women are always saying, I need to take one more course, or I'm not quite sure I know how to do this, or I'm not. I mean, guys who are dumber than this coffee table um, <laughs> have no hesitation at all, you know. I'm, I'm set, I'm ready to go. Go where? Well, I'm not quite sure, but I'm, I'm ready. I'll get in the car, you know. I'll, and, and somehow we've got to, I think, encourage more women to be risk takers and just say, I'm ready. Pick me. Thank you. Thank you. Peggy, how has your sense of work changed over your life? Your long life. My long life. life. <laughs> <laughs> My sense of work. Um, or has it changed? Yeah. Well, we got a little hint about these questions, so you had to really think a lot before you came out here. Um, it has changed. I have always uh, worked really hard. Actually, no. In academics and college, excuse me, I did not work hard at all. I, <laughs> I went to college. It was one of the things that bound us together. <laughs> <laughs> I went to college to have a great time, and I did. So, <laughs> moving on. Um, but. But after but that, you graduated in I four graduate, years. I graduated in four years. Yeah. Yes, I did. Yeah. Um, my college gave me an honorary degree at some point several years ago, and the past <laughs> president of the college read the citation. And right before she read it, she turned to me and she said, "I cannot believe I am reading this about you, <laughs> and we're giving you an honorary degree." Um, <laughs> but once I got into stuff that I that I love doing, um, uh, which mainly was teaching in a in a big inner city all African-American high school in DC, um, you know, it's like you kick in, right? And so, and so I have a really strong work ethic, and I know, and I know that work takes a lot of discipline, and, I, and I, academically I was a late bloomer, um, but I bloomed. Um, so I've always known that about myself. I have learned a few things, though. One is that I could accomplish a lot more than I ever thought I could. Um, because when you want to do something, and I don't know if this is true for men because I'm not one, but, but I feel like for women, it's like when you want to do something, we just figure out a way to do it. And, and, and I think that's true for lots and lots of women. So there was a point in my life when I was working full time, I was raising two kids by myself, and 
I got an offer from American, American University offered me an assistantship to get a PhD. So, but, I, but you had to take a full schedule. You couldn't take a crummy little few credits at a time. <laughs> you had to do the whole boat. And, and if I did that, they would, um, you know, they would pay my way through. At the time, I had absolutely, I had no, paying for a PhD, I had no possibility of paying for a PhD. And I did all those things. So, and I sat, I had a kid who was in the fifth grade, and one of my kids was in the ninth grade, and I said, okay, we, I have this opportunity, like, we have this opportunity, what do you think? They were like, mom, which I had to remind them of later. This was, like, before <laughs> online. This is way before you could, you had to, like, show up in class all the time. <laughs> it's not like this fabulous way you guys can get degrees now. So it was not easy, but, and people said to, say to me now, and sometimes I think, how did you do that? And I say, mm -hmm. I have no idea how I did it. You know, my son says, my son who has a PhD, who he got the normal way, and is a college professor, said, Mom, I just remember coming in and you would have your entire bed, like at six o'clock in the morning, covered with index cards, <laughs> you know, of things that you would be memorizing or statistical formulas or whatever. So, so I can do a lot more than I thought I could. Um, I've also learned, and actually, I want to loop back somewhere about this, and this also riffs on something Kathleen said, confidence, in the whole notion of confidence, especially among women in the workplace, is huge. And I have been studying that for a long time. It is immense, it's an immensely powerful thing all by itself. So my sense about that has changed. And the other thing um, that has changed is I feel like, in addition to all, whatever work I'm doing, and I mean, you may know, like, I'm not like anybody else here, right? I'm not, a, I'm not on the president's cabinet. I'm not the president of a university. I'm not like an esteemed head of faculty. I'm much more regular than this crowd that I'm <laughs> I mean, I'm more normal than this crowd I'm with, right? <laughs> but, and, and I've done a bunch of different kinds of jobs, but all of which have to do with education because I feel like mm, that's the most important thing on earth. But what I, what I also know is in addition to whatever work I'm doing, a really, really important part of my job is to coach and mentor and teach young women that I'm working with. I feel like that is always part of my job, and I felt that for a long, long time. And so, whatever, you know, I'm gonna be working until I fall into some tomb somewhere, <laughs> but, but wherever, whatever that is, or wherever I'm doing it, um, coaching and teaching and advising and giving women who work for me opportunities to, to grow and get stronger and have broader experiences is a, is a huge, part of my work, and I did not always think that, so. That's terrific, thank you. Yes. So, um, in the interest of uh, moving along, I'm, I'm going to just ask a bunch of questions. Um, so Kathleen, what kind of work do you want to do in the future? <laughs> <laughs> um, or have you thought about that? I, I don't know, I, I think that it would be hard to, um, do work that didn't involve, uh, most of my work in some way, shape, or form has uh, involved um, women and girls' issues and children's issues. And I see those a lot about the future. I think that's, that's the most important thing to me, is, is the work needs to be about the future, um, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Feel like you're making a change, making a difference, moving um, in a direction forward. So uh, I've never had, uh, I know it sounds a little odd, and there are people who now look at my bio and say, oh, you must have done this in order to do this, and, and clearly you plotted this out. And um, I don't know about those of you in the audience, it's always easier to create a narrative of how you plan things out when you're looking back <laughs> than when you're looking forward. I mean, most of what I have done, I did not plot out very carefully. I ran for the legislature for the first time, literally in order to go home. My kids were two and five. I was working um, in a very busy job. I was traveling a lot, and it just didn't work for my husband and me. He was a busy trial lawyer. Uh, it, so the legislature was part-time in Kansas, and I could really go home. Uh, I could be at the state capitol five minutes from my kid's school. It was a 90-day work session. so. Um, People you know, said later, oh, you clearly did that so you could run for governor. I said, no, I really did it to go home. Um, it, um, so I think that the future is really about what the next opportunity is, but I'm, I'm sure it will have something to do with progress and change and um, 
the, the issues around women and girls have always been uh, very important to me. Uh, and I did, I've only gone to girls' schools. And you talk about, um, you know, knowing girls can do everything. I think when I was uh, in, very early on, you know, when you're in a girls' environment only, um, I mean, I was raised with brothers, but in, in a school environment, what you quickly learn is girls are the smartest in the class and they're the dumbest in the class. They're the athletes and they're the ballerinas. Uh, they're the, um, you know, the, the stars and the um, shy ones. So you have a, a vision of life for a very long time. And most of our teachers were women. Mm -hmm. um, nuns are accidental feminists, it turns out. You know, they're raising this generation of women. Um, but, so you're raised with a vision that you really can do anything. Great. Thank you. Peggy, we're going to come back to you. Oi. What female leader, past, present, pa fictional or real, do you most <laughs> admire and why? I ask this because of your literary background. I know, but I'm not going to give you an answer like that. <laughs> and you won't ever invite me back. All right. <laughs> well, so I'm a Shakespearean, right? But the women in Shakespeare don't fare so well, <laughs> right? <laughs> if you think about the plays you read in high school, they either go mad or die before Act Three. Um, and, and then the, in the comedies, they do a little better. But, it, but the comedies all end up all right in Shakespeare because the woman gets married at the end. So I'm going to leap right over that. Because I thought a lot about this question, and I thought, well, who is there in literature, or who do I think there should be a statue to? And so I don't have the right kind of answer. Here's my answer, but it's not the right answer. <laughs> there is no right answer. Yeah, I love this. <laughs> um, I feel like there are the women, women leaders um, that are incredibly effective and incredibly powerful are not always the people that you, no, no offense given, are not always the people you read about in the paper, and they're not always the people who, you know, who are on a statue, and they're not always the people whose portraits are hanging. You know, I think that, I think that we are leaders to each other mm -hmm. all the time, especially women, I think, are leaders to each other all the time. And so when I think about people whose leadership has affected me profoundly, I started off thinking, well, I should say something about Eleanor Roosevelt, oh, I, right? Right, that's but then, where I was going. Okay, no, but then I thought, <laughs> like, there's only one Eleanor Roosevelt, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I couldn't, like, get into Eleanor. Well, I mean, though I think Eleanor Roosevelt is wonderful, <laughs> but I thought I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not doing that. But I, so, so here are two examples of women who you have never heard of who have been incredibly powerful leaders for me. One is a woman named Carolyn Reed Wallace, who I worked for at the Corporation for Public Broadcasting in 1995 for a few years. It, quite an extraordinary woman. It scared me to death. She hired me. She sought me out and hired me. I was totally pleased. I was terrified the entire time I worked for her. But she is the one who called me into her office one day and shut the door and said, OK, I want to tell you something. And that is, she said, you know about the MacArthur Genius Awards, and I said, I do. And she said, you have been nominated for a MacArthur Genius Award. And I said, what? <laughs> and she said, I'm not supposed to tell you this. These are, this is all very secret, secret. I don't know, I don't even know who the nominee, I, I don't know anything about it. But she said, I'm not supposed to tell you this. Nobody is supposed to ever reveal any of this stuff. But she said, I am telling you this because you need to hear the fact that people are looking at your work and they are noticing your work and they are mm. seeing that you are doing very, that your work is very fine. That was hugely important to me. So maybe she, I don't know, like more than Eleanor Roosevelt. So that was one example. <laughs> the other example is a young woman, I'm, I'm not kidding. So at this point I was 40 something something and this young woman was in her middle 20s and um, she was part of the mediation service in the court in D.C. And I was separated from my husband, which was the right thing to do. And, and, but we were involved in this horrible mediation about our kids. Not about custody, but about money. You know, money. <laughs> um, but my, and my daughter, we shared custody. My daughter was in high school, and she lived part of the time with him. And he had remarried. Um, he had a, I'm trying to think if there's any connection. I could ever possibly have a connection to anybody in this room. <laughs> my, 
my ex-husband remarried someone who was sort of akin to Cruella de Vil, I would say, <laughs> and was not nice to my children. And so my daughter was really unhappy living there half of the time, but, but I kept thinking it'll get better and she needs a relationship with her father. And this young woman who, I, you know, I saw her, we started a conversation about something else entirely, and she said, how's it going and how's Beth doing? And, and I said, well, you know, it's tough, but I'm sure it's going to get better. She said, well, how long has this been going on? I said, well, like a year and a half. And she looked at me and she said, if she needs to get out of there, you need to get her out of there. Yeah. And she was, she was a tremendous leader to me, a tremendous leader. Um, and so I did, and it made a huge difference, not only, well, it, it made a huge difference in the life of my daughter, who has become a mental health counselor. <laughs> I just want to say that. <laughs> so I think we, so I don't know, I started off thinking about people and how they should be on pedestals, but I feel like all of us have leaders like that in our lives, and, they, and for me, they are on pedestals. I would say, like, it seems I haven't known Katrina long enough, but these two have been leaders like that for me for a whole lot of my adult life. Um, so that's my answer. It's, but it's not, it's not the Eleanor Roosevelt answer. I think, I actually, I actually think Eleanor Roosevelt would approve of that answer. Yeah. If I might be so bold to really? channel her, right? right. <laughs> I don't know if either of you have thoughts about uh, a leader, past, present, fictional, or otherwise. Okay, moving along. <laughs> um, Kathleen, how would you like to be characterized as a leader? What kind of a leader would you like people to think or talk about you as? It's a terrible sentence, but you know what I mean. Well, I think that um, my experience is that a lot of women lead in different ways than men lead. Um, and I think it's really important uh, that um, I, inclusiveness is, uh, I think, one of the hallmarks, making sure that not only people feel empowered, um, but really feel included. And I guess my, um, my experience is that whether it's policy or personnel decisions or you know, operational issues or you know, how the cafeteria works, it's better with everybody's input. It, it makes more sense. Um, I think a lot of men are kind of command and control, and a lot of women are what I would call servant leaders. And that doesn't mean you, at, I would very much agree with Peggy, you don't have to be the head of something to be a leader. It's really about um, sharing your experience, finding people who uh, you know, need some encouragement and helping him. All of those are, are issues. I think the most powerful leaders for me were, were actually moms who were moms before I was. I was, um, I felt very competent in a professional world. I didn't have my first child until I was 33 and my second at 36. I knew I could be a really good dad. <laughs> I figured, you know, <laughs> ball games, you know, put the jackets on, drive the car on trips. Um, but my mother was an incredible mother, and I was really terrified that I would never be able to be that kind of mother. And, and having, I mean, the leaders who were really so important to me were moms who would say, you can really do this, you know, and here's how you do it, and here's the step along the way, or mentors who did that for me in a workplace. Um, and I had some wonderful women who, who would sort of, again, guide me along the way. So I guess that's how I would like to um, be, be thought of. Um, I, much like Peggy, have spent a lot of time trying to identify, mentor, encourage uh, employees, uh, watch them grow, give them the next step, because I, people did that for me. And you know, the number of people who say, you can do this. And, um, and if you find people around who don't tell you that, then get somebody else around you. Um, you know, I used to say to girls, if you have a boyfriend who says, oh, you really shouldn't apply to this school, or you shouldn't do that, get a new boyfriend. <laughs> I mean, you know, it isn't that you're not good enough to do this. It's that this guy really is, um, 
has limited views. So I think, I think that kind of empowering and, and really a servant leader, so you, you actually lead by example and by rolling your sleeves up and getting the job done as opposed to ordering people to do various things. You know, both can accomplish a task, but I think you end up with a very different kind of dynamic if everybody's at the table and participates. Right. You know, I forgot, if I were better prepared, I would remember the Lao Tzu um, quotation, which is that I want people to say this of me as a leader, uh, which is they did it by themselves. They did it, right. You know, it's a terrible paraphrasing, but the idea, and I think that's actually very apropos to fielding, I might say, at this point, which is that the relationship between faculty and students is so collegial but I think when we do our jobs best, students think they have done it themselves. That they don't, right. that they don't feel um, that the faculty member has done it on their behalf. They can own the success. And I've been thinking about Peggy's comment about teaching, too, because I think when I think about leaders who've inspired me, it's people who are teachers. The teaching isn't just a profession, but we can do it every day in every interaction that we have. And, and I love the way you put it, Kathleen, about mentoring, being present, being inclusive, being relational, moving away from that command and control style. And, and I think I've seen men lead that way also. Mm -hmm. I think part of it is, as we get, you know, as I said at the very beginning, we get kind of stuck in these norms and these habits and patterns. And, and it would be, I mean, wonderful for all of society if we could break out of those patterns and think about, in a complex world, we have to be more inclusive, right? Decisions are made better when they're made collectively. Action is stronger when it's collective. Mm -hmm. and, and so I can see how leading and teaching are really connected to each other in, our, in all of our comments. Thank you. Kathleen, I'm going to ask you another question. Um, and I, um, well, I won't editorialize. What are some of the things that sustain you when you're in difficult situations? Oh, I've never been in <laughs> Let's start there. Um, <laughs> I would certainly say that having um, a sense of some mission, so in the middle of a, you know, a mess, uh, just having a sense that um, what you're doing is important, and so you got to work your way out of the mess, um, and that it's it's important <clears throat> enough. Failure is not an option, uh, and so I think that that sense of um, you know sort of critical thinking, and I guess I've always had um, maybe it's because I've been in enough messes over the time. Um, the the notion that you also just sort of have to have a plan. I mean, Peggy talks about being in a situation where you, you're juggling all these things and you don't quite know how you're going to get there. And sometimes it seems impossible. And I guess, uh, you know, just figuring out, okay, I can't figure the whole thing out. I don't know what the end chapter is going to be, but how about tomorrow? You know, what am I going to do tomorrow? What are the three things? And, and what about next week? And uh, I think that ability so that at the end of a month, you can look back and say, oh, I was here and now I'm here, uh, makes a huge difference. Certainly, keeping some sort of sense of humor is very helpful. Um, uh, more helpful than drinking heavily or doing any of those, um, you know, and, and having, having friends, uh, having people who um, you know will be uh, able to not only be supportive, but also help kind of figure out. I mean, sometimes things seem pretty dark, and, and just having some sense of direction is, is helpful. Um, but at the end of the day, again, to me, it, it sort of comes back to having some confidence in yourself um, that you really can figure this out, that it is going. I've always been um, optimistic. I, I think um, it's, uh, I wouldn't be a, a Democrat in Kansas if you weren't <laughs> optimistic. Um, you know, it's sort of, uh, um, 
So you have to have a vision of something that maybe be a little different than the reality that you see day to day. And that, that really does help sustain, um, sustain you hmm. along the way. I, I was just thinking about the notion of, um, you put it differently, but the notion that you can't stop. I mean, what are you going to do? Quit? What are you going to do? Uh, turn around and retreat? I mean, there. Get under your bed. Stay there. <laughs> yeah. Right, that there is a sense, and I don't know whether that comes from our families or whether it comes from our culture or the times in which we grew up or our educations, but the notion that um, you keep going forward. Keep, well, my father used to say, keep putting one foot in front of the other. Yeah. Well, yeah. and it's the same, I mean, I, I, I've been very blessed in that, you know, I haven't. Um, we haven't been faced with any serious health issues uh, in our family. But I often think, you know, the parents who um, have a very ill child, and how do you deal with that day mm -hmm. in and day? I mean, how do you deal with a situation, and I certainly have had friends do it, where you can't make it better? You can't, um, and again, you just, you have to have sort of a sense of direction and a sense of, you can fix what you can. Uh, you got to have some faith in, in the rest of the, and um, I think that's a more profoundly difficult situation than certainly I've ever found myself in. But it's, it's that same, I think, sense that um, you just keep going. You yeah. know, you keep, you keep mobilizing resources from inside and outside. And mm -hmm. the resources outside are friends and faith and family and, um, you know, people to sustain you. And, that's mm -hmm. really helpful. I think a lot of it has to do with faith. And some people have religious faith, and some people have faith in other human beings, or I mean, whatever kind of brand you have, and also in yourself. So I want to tell this little story about you that I just thought about, which I think is OK. I don't know. Well, <laughs> you know way too many stories but it has about to do, me. Well, I'm not going to tell one of those. But, <laughs> um, no, but it, it has to do with leadership, and it also has to do with faith. So. So Kathleen, you know, was twice elected governor of Kansas, and the first time she um, ran for governor, um, I went down there on the weekend before election night and hung around and did nothing except sit around and be nervous about everything. And, um, and on the day, I don't think it was election, election day, it was a Tuesday, it might have been the day before, I, I just sort of hung around with Kathleen, and on the day before, we went to her election headquarters, and there were loads and loads and loads of people there. I guess people who had been all over the state before they all kind of gathered together. And, and lunch was brought in. So Kathleen you know, provided them all with lunch. And, and, and she started to you know, give a little talk about, thank you so much, and you know, this has been a great effort. And I'm noticing that there are these piles of like, that look like paper lunch bags, like paper sacks. And then they are getting, you know this, yes. So they're getting passed out, and I'm thinking, what, what is going on here? And she said, she said to them, I'm not going to do this nearly as well as you did, but she said to them, she said to everybody who was there, and this is like her leaders and the people who are knocking on doors and everybody. She, and so in each of these sacks were a handful of tulip bulbs. And this was November. And she said, I want you to go home and plant these bulbs. And when these bulbs come up next spring, no matter what happens tomorrow at the polls, know what a fabulous thing that all of us did together. Know that there are going to be tulips springing up all over Kansas like yours. And know that this is something fabulous that we did together. And also know that these tulips represent your part of this group effort. Wow. That had like such a profound effect on me. It was, I mean, that's real <laughs> leadership. Oh, that's the kind of leader I want to be. Thank you. And even better, we won. Yeah. <laughs> and even better, you won twice. See, I left that part out entirely. Uh, uh, Katrina, in what ways do you think of yourself as a strategic thinker or an opportunistic thinker or some other kind of thinker? You know, I thought about this question, and I'm probably not going to answer it in the way that you You know, <laughs> the independence of the women on this panel is to be admired and rude. <laughs> Go ahead. I was thinking about how many leadership assessment tools there are. 
in the world, and you can take any number of them, and they will tell you your different qualities and your strengths and your attributes and so on. And so, in terms of your leadership style, you know, you can be an achiever, a, collabor a collaborative person, a directive person, analytical, and so on, and that you carry all those qualities. But you asked a, a tougher question around what kind of thinker. Because we all think, I mean, strategy is a word we use all the time. I'm right. going to make a strategic trip to the coffee shop. <laughs> I'm going to, it's about strategic action. Um, it's about strategic management. We always put that in front of everything because it sounds sharper and more focused. And so I, I, you, this question actually made me think, what does it mean to be a strategist? And, and part of that, the downside of thinking about everything as a strategy is it has a slightly manipulative quality. I'm going to be on this chessboard and I'm going to move all these pieces. And to me, that's sort of antithetical to the relational notion, to the collective notion that we work together. So when I think of the kind of thinker I am, I mean, you might say by listening to me that I'm a hopelessly confused one. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the case. But I actually am fairly philosophical. So I take the long view of things. And, and at the same time, I try not to get distracted by the long view of things. So I think about President Obama, who I don't know as well as Kathleen knows, I assume. Um, he, he once emails said, me every day. I know, he emails <laughs> Anna every day. <laughs> me too. <laughs> he once said in an interview not too long ago that in the long sweep of history, all of our roles, no matter what role we happen to be in in the moment, is to work on our paragraph. And I love that metaphor. I mean, as a thinker, I think about mm -hmm. You know, philosophically where you are, what your values are, and then what are the actions you take that you're working on your paragraph? And I think, I want to leave my paragraph and my, the world, when I'm finally keel over, in such a way that my paragraph has value for others, hmm. that I help others, heal others, educate others, inspire others, and we act together. Thank you. Thank you. You answered a better question than the one I asked, so thank you. Um, Peggy, do you learn more from your successes or your failures? Can you explain and give an example? I can. I can. <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt. Yeah, no. no. <laughs> I love Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, I think you learn, let's see, I think a couple of things. One, I think almost never is something a complete failure or a complete success. I feel like there are parts of both of those in whatever happens. Maybe, maybe there's a, I mean, obviously there's a larger percentage, but never, I don't think anything is ever a complete failure or a complete success. I think you learn from both. I think that learning from a success is a lot more fun <laughs> than learning from a failure because a failure, you know, somehow a failure, I don't know, I could be just revealing the most venal parts of my personality, but you know, a failure really forces you to sit down and say, dang, you know, what happened? What did I do? What did I, who messed up here? Whatever. Um, and, and with a success, you can, you know, pop a few corks, and, and it doesn't necessarily force you to reflect. Um, but the, example I, the examples I have center around the four years that I spent working on the leadership team of D.C. Public Schools during the time when uh, our chancellor was Michelle Rhee, who is someone who, of whom perhaps you have heard, <laughs> um, who was a hard-charging, young, incredibly dynamic um, woman who, who was hired by the mayor. The mayor achieved mayoral control right when he was elected, Adrian Fenty, and then hired Michelle Rhee, who had never been, a, never been a superintendent of schools, to come in and really this, this was the sorriest school district in the country, D.C. Public Schools. It was a, it's a school district for which I have an immense amount of affection because I taught there, my kids went there. Um, and I wrote to her and said, you got anything for me to do? And so I ended up on the leadership team there. Um, and it was an incredibly fraught four years. There were, um, she had, I mean, she broke a ton of glass getting to, you know, in, we instituted a whole new way to evaluate teachers. I mean, there's a whole, there are books written. Um, and so it was, it was incredibly chaotic. It was right on the bleeding edge of school reform. Um, some of that stuff was very successful, but we didn't know it at the time. You know, it looked, what looked like failure at one point 
three mm -hmm. years later looked like success. I mean, right. that's the other right. reason why this stuff kind of waltzes along a continuum right. a little bit. Michelle herself, you know, incredibly um, dynamic and powerful, smart, a genius, so, in some instances, I think made gigantic mistakes. Um, I felt like I was a failure almost, well, I felt like I was a failure about half the time that I worked there. I felt like I just could not, my, my job was, was connecting to the community, which is a little tough when, well, we're closing six schools in your community, but let us talk to you about it. Um, or, or, and we've already closed them, actually. And so now let's talk, I mean, it was not well thought out, but, but and actually I inherited a lot of that stuff. But, so, but it, was a, it was a tough time because I felt like we weren't, getting, we weren't making the progress that we, that we could make. And, and there were times when I thought I was a failure. There were times when she thought I was a failure. Um, there were times when, you know, we also thought we were, we were doing the right thing, that we thought that the other were successful. It was, it was incredibly intense and tough, really, really tough. It was the toughest job I've ever done, and I've done a lot of tough jobs. Um, but, what, but the interesting thing there was things that initially felt like great successes seemed in the, in, in the due service of time not to be so successful, and things that seemed like they were miserable failures began after, after two years, three years, you began to see that they weren't failures at all, right. you know, and that, and that they began to, to be successful. So I think you learn from all of it, but I think that it's not an either or. Right, and categorizing them even is probably foolish as well. Well, no, I'm not saying that. I thought no, it was no, like, oh. I actually thought, I learned something from your yeah. answer. No, I agree with you. When I, now that I think about it, I think to myself, the success is usually in the moment, and the question is whether or not it's going to last, endure, be sustainable. Well, I mean, in some things. In other things, like you win the election or you don't, you know, or you get the job or you don't. I mean, some things are... More, um, more like, like more yeah, you know, black like and white. Any but in, my, in the, the biggest, I mean, in the in that category, the biggest thing for me, the biggest lesson for me there was that you and, and so you could never feel good about anything for long, <laughs> and you, you could feel bad if you're me. You could feel bad about for, for a long, long time. time. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but I think that's. I mean, I would say even even in the examples that you gave, Anna, the you know, not getting the job or even losing the election, um, those are never, usually, they don't have to be total failures. Right. You know, you didn't get this, pe but often the fact that you applied opens Actually, doors. Right. And I, right. I mean, so I, I think that um, the notion that all, all of those issues are often continuum, and that if you learn something out of it, and you learn something particularly about yourself, and the next time you do whatever it is better, and you, you know, I know a lot of people who ran for office once, lost, and then turned right around and ran again, and they, they were terrific, and they were just a much better candidate. They were much better um, connected with people in a whole different way. So I mean, I think there's, there is something about having an experience, um, and even if it, in that moment it seems like it's pretty bleak, often it leads, it leads to something that's much more powerful and positive. And you were talking about the transformational elements around fielding, and I think that um, you know, the, the sort of notion of continuous learning mm -hmm. is not just about what happens in a classroom, it's, it's what happens in life. And uh, you know, that there are constant lessons and issues that evolve and incidents that happen. And if you can gather some insight from that, gather some knowledge, uh, you're much wiser, you're much more capable the next time around. And then you turn around and help somebody get through yeah. that the valley um, on their own. Yeah, so. thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was really helpful to me. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen. Is, yes, the, is the success of an effort measured by its outcomes or its intentions? Hmm. Hmm. Well, in some ways, I think, um, or we, or you know, and as I about thought about this, it's, it's really a little bit connected to what we just talked about. Right. And I think it's, it's both. Um, I'm not sure that just intentions are ever enough. I mean, if you, if you don't, at the end of the day, have something to show, um, you probably can't 
regard whatever it is as a success. Um, but I think it, it also isn't just, you know, do you have a dashboard and can you measure this? And um, so I, I think a lot of times it's the process along the way. And are you making progress? Um, as opposed to where you end up at the end of the, the project. Um, and I, I think a lot of the, whether it's the issues that I've worked on, I mean, they're never finished. They're never, in, in Katrina's term, you're doing your paragraph on, right. on an issue or a moment. And I think just the sense that you you able to move the ball a bit forward or you know push that rock up the hill just a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know that I've ever done much that I, I could say at the end of the day, this is done. Mm -hmm. Wow, you know, completed. Yeah. It's, it's terrific. Nobody's ever going to have to work on this again. Um, <laughs> I, so I, I never have had that sense of, of um, finality, but I think it, um, in most things, whether it's you know, raising a child or being in a relationship or working on a policy or having a job, are really not black and white. It's it's a progress and a and a process. Right. Both of you are reminding me of the dangers of dichotomous thinking. You know, and about any time that one frames questions um, or situations dichotomously that way, it usually ends up being an unsatisfying analysis, really. But it's a good. I mean, I think we use that terminology so much. It's good to sort of confront it and say. Is it this or this? And to be able to say, well, it's both. Well, it's both <laughs> and, right. It's both. Well, it, but, you're, but the success and failure question and the outcome or intentions, right. they all go together. Right, that's right. what and I would say, very tied, yeah, right. yeah, very much tied up. Um, Peggy, um, how are women's work and life choices, even today, including your own, shaped by the policies, customs, or structures that are not really under our control. Mm -hmm. How have you experienced that? I don't know. I, I, knew, I mean, I think, right, we haven't, I haven't, I didn't tell you that you could say I don't know, but. <laughs> <laughs> but I bet you thought if I didn't know, I would say I don't know. I, I feel like, there we, um, Kathleen was talking to some girls, or, uh, young girls earlier from Girls Inc, and, and um, and the, one of them asked you about breaking stereotypes. You know, if there were stereotypes that you broke, and you said, well, I don't know, I got into a field where, the, where you talked about your prison, your corrections work, and how there weren't many women in that I field. really haven't been in prison. No, right. <laughs> really <laughs> Her corrections work. Um, so I, I don't know I about, I mean, there were constraints in my, um, I grew up in a time when women were uh, nurses and teachers essentially, if, if they went to work, if you didn't get a husband by the time you graduate from college. I say that to young women now, and they look at me like I am a museum piece, <laughs> which I am, you know, obviously. So, so and, and actually, the reason I did not want to teach at all was because of, of that, except I ended up, I already told you my route to teaching, but, um, but I didn't feel constrained. But I mean, you know, in our graduating class in college, there was one woman two women who went to medical school, which was incredible, two, and one woman who went to law school. So, you know, it was not very imaginative <laughs> what we did, you know, and, and, and all women were expected to be able to type. This seems incredible. So, so those were, I mean, so there were expectations laid on us, but we did believe that we didn't really have to pay any attention to them. Now, it took a bunch of us a while to get you know, jobs, the kind of jobs that guys got. And actually, we still don't have the kind of jobs that guys have, which is a different thing. But I, um, I, guess, I guess the constraints I felt were constraints that I could break. You know, I, um, I was in a marriage that, that lots and lots of people thought was the model marriage and that we were the model family. And the fact is, we weren't. I'm sure that hasn't happened to anybody here. <laughs> um, and... And, and I, you know, I was brought up a Catholic. I was a pretty, I was a much more traditional thinker than I thought I was. Um, and so to, to have to say, this isn't it, you know, I think we need to do something else. We need to look at this honestly and make a change here. Um, and, and that's, and actually what I learned then from a lot of women that I knew 
they said, Peggy, why, like, why are you doing this? You're going to be financially, you're not going to be well off. You're not going to be like, why can't you figure out how to make this work? And that's when I, I was astounded to learn how many women settle because they are afraid of sort of, you know, taking a risk or, or, and having just enormous faith that you can somehow, you know, make it work out. Mm -hmm. So, so I, don't, I don't feel like there have been any um, specific, you know, stop signs, but there, but there have been places where I think many women, generations of women before me, or maybe women who are not me, um, would have, you know, would have stopped and, mm -hmm. and been constrained, but I, I don't know. So that's why I don't know how to really answer that mm -hmm. in the right way. It's um, help. Well, I, it's, it's a hard question because I think the, the stereotypes change, and I, I don't mean to sound so um, stereotypical talking about the roles of men and women, um, but I, I do think, um, you know, there, some of this has changed and some of it hasn't changed very much. Uh, the notion that um, for a lot of women in a lot of different positions, you have to run faster and jump higher and mm -hmm. stay longer and be smarter just to keep pace. Um, so there's a sort of unfairness about that, uh, but it's real. And um, I think that that's, that's difficult to cope with. Our policies in this country about women are awful. I mean, we're one of the only countries um, in the world who has no paid maternity leave, for instance. And I think it relates directly to why we have a high infant mortality rate for a developed country. Uh, women are trying to, you know, have babies and juggle that and be good workers and good parents at the same time, and there's no support, there's no um, kind of childcare support for way too many people. They can't figure out how to be good parents and good workers. Um, so we've got some policies that, and, and that disadvantages men as well as women who are both trying to parent, but it falls more heavily on women over and over again. It, it, there's a sort of unfairness. I remember, um, you know, and, and again, running for office one of the first times when somebody said to me, so are you running as the woman candidate? I said, well, do I have a choice? I mean, I didn't, you know, I, I don't know what my option is. Do I get to be the guy candidate for some reason? Um, I had a great experience um, in an early run for office when, you know, at the legislative level, you could go door to door and you went throughout the door. And one Sunday afternoon, I mean, I was hot in Kansas in August and I was really tired. And I get to this door and I knock on the door and my opponent was a woman. And I um, went to the door and knocked on the door, and this guy came to the door. And uh, I gave my little spiel, you know, I'm running for the legislature, blah, blah, blah. And he looked at me and he said, you know, I'm just so confused. Which one are you? <laughs> there are all these girls on my poor, and he started this spiel. Well, I must say, I lost it. And I, I began this rant of saying, what do you mean, which one am I? <laughs> did you say that to all the guys who held this office, who came to your door, they all, did they all look alike to you? And, and I'm realizing I'm suddenly looking at this man whose eyes are really big <laughs> at this point. And he thinks, I have a crazy woman on my porch and I've got to, so I, I, I suddenly caught myself and I said, remember me, and I gave my opponent's name, and remember me, make sure you vote for me, shook his hand and left and went home. But I thought, you know, if we all look alike, I'm going to take full advantage of that. You want to think one of us is crazy? It's her. It's her. Uh, be my guest. It's a whole new campaign strategy. You, you bet. Um, so, <laughs> so I'm going to ask, uh, now this is the last question, and it's for all of us, and I'm going to change it a little bit. Um, from what I told you I was going to ask, which is um, <laughs> if you were to ask for or give words of wisdom from or to someone else on this stage, uh, what would you ask or say? Can we think about it? Can yeah. we call a friend? <laughs> for a moment, just <laughs> talk about yourself. A lifeline. Yeah. Life <laughs> yeah. Words of wisdom to or from 
Well, honestly, Anna, there's nothing I can give by way of words of wisdom or advice to these wonderful women. Um, but I, but I would say, yes, you can. okay, good, thanks. Um, yes, you can. <laughs> take it out back, please. okay? No, please. Um, you know, but I would say, in just listening to uh, our stories and our comments and reflections, that and something I notice in my students too, the ones who uh, do well by their own measure, whatever that measure is that they decide upon in their lives, is they are tenacious. And I was just thinking about some of the things that that we've all said here tonight is the ability to persist. And I don't just mean under adversity, and it's not you know the usual blah, blah, blah of self-help books, but it's this kind of, it's that what your father said, put one, one foot in front of the other. Okay. It's that sort of, I'm, I'm just here to do my part. You know, there's a humble quality to it. There's that journey of a thousand steps. And so the word of advice or wisdom for take, take what you will from it is, Rick, whatever you are doing, it's being tenacious about it, showing up, persisting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, right, right on. <laughs> I would um, say I've gotten good advice um, from the time I was um, a freshman in college from these two wise women. I didn't know <laughs> Katrina at the time. But Anna and Peggy were a year ahead of me in college. And um, I was uh, totally enamored and fascinated with the women in their class, as well as uh, some spectacular women in my class. And I guess what, what I'm thinking sitting here um, all these years later is um, my best advice is gather women friends along the way and don't ever let them go because they're the best and wisest mentors, advisors, helpers, supporters you will ever have. Um, and if you've lost some along the way, go back and find them um, because that happens, you know, lives change. And I think it's kind of remarkable and I love the fact that here we are, um, you know, years I went to, Trinity College in 1966 and met these two wonderful women and they've been a part of my life ever since and a really important part of my life. So um, that would be, I guess, my, my word of wisdom and advice to um, look around, you know, the colleagues you have at Fielding, the people who you're connected with internationally online, the people who you're gonna find, but um, hang on to them because you're learning something from everybody and the, the kind of help and support uh, is just invaluable. Um, much more than, you know, a lot of the famous people you can meet along the way, that's lovely, but um, these ladies are folks I don't ever want to lose track of. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to jump in, actually, and steal your slot. Really? Yes. Do I get one after you? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Yes. Be no, my but, guess. Yeah. <laughs> it's a it's a riff a little bit on that, which is to say, um, when Peggy and I were talking at one point, you mentioned that we've known each other for almost fifty years. Yeah. Not fifty, but almost close to fifty. And so, I was thinking, in in it was very much. Um, like what you were saying, Kathleen. And, and it has to do with the fact that some people, the, the relation, let's see if I can say this now. Um, when you have relationships that are meaningful and good and important, whether or those people always stay with you. Mm -hmm. That's what I was going to say, actually. There are people that we went to college with, and certainly since then, some people I went to high school with, whom I don't talk to every day, I know some about what they're doing. I mean, some of them are in the news more often than others. But they remain important parts of my life. They mm -hmm. continue to inspire me. They continue to nurture and uh, make me feel like my life is important and meaningful. And their immediate presence is not um, right. as important as the impact that they had on me and continue to have on me. So I guess I would say that to think about the relationships that you have right now and to make the most of them 
because they will sustain you long past the immediacy of the, of the contact uh, disappears. Okay, you get the last word. Yeah, no, I don't want the last word. But I, I, that, that's a, it's a huge, I mean, what, it's just a huge gift. And, and, and you must know this, but I mean, it's a, it's a gigantic gift in your life. And when you, and when we were young, we knew it was a gift. But, but as you get older, it becomes, it becomes more special, I think, and more, and more, um, you treasure it, I think, all the more. And you also need it. <laughs> all the more and, and, and value it in that way. Um, I want to link back to something that, um, which, which is kind of a thread though th w that we've been talking about, though we haven't called it that. But it's something that I think about some, which, is, which I mentioned before, which is the whole thing about confidence. And I, I, am, I have been studying, not formally as in a fielding student, but um, I have been studying on the hoof sort of the whole notion of confidence in women in young women and also in women of all ages. And, and I feel like that is, um, that's something that's really important that I think for a lot of women in the workplace, it's an important thing to think about. Some of us have it, some of us, I, I feel like this woman was at the head of the line when they passed out confidence. I feel like I was somewhere in the back third of the line when they passed out confidence. And, and so, and, and I think lots of times we have it in certain places and then we, you know, kind of goes like this, we lose it and then we, but we always, I mean, I feel like we always have to pretend we have it even when we don't have it. And, and so sometimes when, um, and, and I've also seen that confidence all by itself, Michelle Rhee is a perfect example of this, confidence all by itself is an immensely powerful thing. It can absolutely get things done practically all by itself. So, and it's something also I think sometimes that, that sometimes women shy away from. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're too confident, there are other adjectives that describe, we would describe men as being confident, <laughs> but there are other adjectives that we would use to describe women like that. So I just, I, 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 I just want to drop that in because I think it's, I think it's a very, it's something that's very important in, in our professional lives and, and, or in our work lives or in, you know, the in work we do. personal lives. Yeah, but the work we do with the PTA or yeah. whatever. But it's an, it's an important thing. Um, and so for me, when I'm kind of groping around trying to, you know, figure out a hard thing or figure out why I didn't, didn't get this right or whatever, these kinds of friends that, that we are talking about are something that is, that is a real touchstone for me. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank each of you. We will um, remain in place, as they say, uh, for the closing. But it's um, an enormous honor to be on this stage with you. Um, you are so smart and wonderful, each of you. So thank them for me. Um, I'd like to invite Perry Longo um, up to the stage. Perry is the Santa Barbara Poet Laureate Emerita. In 2012, she received the Women of Achievement Award from the Santa Barbara Chapter, the Association for Women in Communication. Uh, she's published poetry and articles in numerous journals and anthologies and four books of poetry. She is the poetry chair for the Nucle Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for the incredible conversation. It's been such an honor. And I, I was asked to say a little something before I read my poem in context of the poem. Um, and I couldn't help but thinking when I heard this phrase, women of all ages, um, the, the poem I'm going to read is titled, What Do Women Want? And, and, and thanks to Dr. Freud. And, um, <laughs> In 1971, I came across this question for the first time when I was putting together a reader's theater script, tracing the role of women in literature from the Bible to that time Helen Reddy singing, singing I am woman, hear me roar. <laughs> and I, I finally got around to answering the question in 2009 when the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation gave awards and had their annual um, award awards given for, to women for peace. So I finally answered this question. 
What do women want? We want to be rain and thunder, want our voices to summon sustenance from our battered earth. We want to be heard in the sheaves of wheat, the rustle of scarves. We want to fling a stone of hope in the still pond, watch ripples pulse across the great divide. Want to step from behind war's shadow, want to be sun, gather and stand in gardens we've planted, firmly rooted, up to our ears in green, rich in food that bulges from each mound and heavy branch. We hack back vines that choke us all, open windows and walls, open doors through which we freely come and go and return without dodging snipers, without running away from our lives. May we never again give birth to martyrs flown home without limbs or vision. Everywhere, women want to be whole together, make stew, simmer all that is true in the broth of human goodness, invite every man, woman, and child to toss in a favored spice, a wish, a way to rebuild our fractured world. With tomorrow in our wombs, we will carry bowls of peace from hearth to each table, however remote. That's all we want. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Perry. Um, if you are a friend of Fielding, uh, we hope that you've enjoyed uh, this evening and that you'll uh, treasure our friendship even more. If you're new to Fielding, uh, we hope that you'll come back and uh, consider this a new friend in your life. And uh, please stay tuned to the uh, Worldwide Network for Gender Empowerment, which is relaunched as part of this event. Um, and lastly, I want to thank in particular, and this is dangerous because of the number of people who were involved here, but I would like to thank Hillary Edwards and Kirsten McGregor for their leadership and David Edelman for their leadership in making this evening possible. Thank you all very much. Même endroit. Je peux dire que tu n'as pas fait grand-mère.